subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss any video lesson from Rao's IES Study Circle. Join the official Telegram channel of Rao's IES Study Circle to stay updated and get all the materials on the Telegram. The link to the channel can be found in the description box. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from UPSC Civil Services Examination Perspective. Today let us take up the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 27th October 2022. These are the list of the news for today's discussion and the timestamp has also been provided in the YouTube description. Now before starting today's discussion, let's go through the weekly practice question for mains from DNS video lectures. So today's question has been taken from the DNS of 19th September 2022 where we discussed this article titled Geopolitics without Geoeconomics is a fool's errand. So the question is, New Delhi should rethink its geoeconomic choices if it is serious about enhancing its geopolitical influence in the Indo-Pacific region. Critically examine the statement in the backdrop of India not joining key multilateral trade agreements in the Indo-Pacific. And this question carries 15 marks, needs to be answered in 250 words. So before attempting this particular question, you can go through the DNS dated 19 September 2022 to have a proper understanding about this particular topic. And the description for this particular question will be provided in the YouTube description. Now let's take up this news appearing on page number 6. And this news talks about handloom sector in India. And it says that handloom sector in India is next to the farming sector, which would offer employment to lakhs of people. Now although this news appears in a political context, However, let us understand the significance of the handloom sector for Indian economy. So handloom refers to any loom other than power loom and includes any hybrid loom on which at least one process for weaving requires manual intervention or human energy for production. So basically it requires human energy for production of yarn or any textile material. Now the handloom textiles constitute a timeless facet of the rich cultural heritage of India and as an economic activity, the handloom sector occupies a place next to agriculture in terms of providing livelihood to the people of India. Further, handloom forms a precious part of the generational legacy and exemplifies the richness and diversity of our country and also the artistry of the weavers and also artisans. And the tradition of weaving by hand is a part of India's cultural ethos and handloom is unparalleled in its flexibility and versatility. And overall, handloom sector also promotes cultural heritage of India. So the handloom sector has various benefits or multiple benefits such as it requires less capital for its functioning, it consumes less power, since it is a product of manual intervention where human energy is involved, it is economically friendly, it provides substantial employment both in rural and urban India and employment in the handloom industry are in nature of both direct and indirect employment and according to the handloom census, it employs more than 72% of Indian women. So it also promotes women empowerment and overall it promotes our cultural heritage. Now another important aspect is that India celebrates National Handloom Day on 7th August every year and it is organized by Ministry of Textiles. And this date can be traced back to Indian history in 1905 with respect to the Swadeshi movement. And the various materials which are produced by the Indian handloom industry are fabrics, floor coverings such as mats, kitchen wares, etc, clothing and also fashion accessories. So the handloom sector not only provides employment to a substantial number of people in India, but it also acts as a carrier of India's cultural heritage which is further promoted to other countries as various handloom products are also exported to different countries of the world through which India effectively promotes its rich cultural heritage to different parts of the world. Now despite these benefits of the handloom sector, it still faces multiple challenges despite various assistance provided by the central government, which means that central government has provided number of assistance through welfare schemes. 
So what we need to understand in this discussion is about the benefits of handloom industry, the various challenges or multiple challenges faced by the handloom industry and different government schemes or welfare programs provided for the handloom sector. Now based on this the practice question for our mains becomes critically examine the growth of handloom sector in India in the backdrop of assistance provided by the central government. So in this question you need to highlight about the importance and the growth of handloom sector in India basically its various benefits and also some of the concerns faced by the sector despite various government schemes or despite various government welfare programs. So according to the handloom census of 2019-20 this industry employs about 35 lakhs 22,512 handloom workers across the country. and this industry mainly employs women workers with a share of 72.29% so overall we can say that this is one sector which effectively promotes women empowerment however the concerning fact here is that according to the handloom census of 2009-10 there were approx 43 lakhs employers in the industry so we understand that number of people employed in the industry has declined so this is also another concern with respect to the handloom sector now this particular graph highlights about the export of various handloom products and here you can see clothing accessories made ups floor coverings and fabrics are exported around the world so there are substantial scope for export of various handloom products however there are number of concerns and challenges and the first and major concern is the fragmented nature of the handloom sector in india and this fragmented nature of the entire sector distributed across rural and urban india it further impacts its sales and also growth also because of weak marketing links another set of challenge is threats from power looms and increasing import of finished products mainly from china now the handloom sector also faces obsolete technologies and this is because of lack of working capital or lack of availability of finance for the handloom sector another set of concern is unorganized production system and low productivity and both these simultaneously or together impact its overall sales another major concern is inadequate working capital and also low penetration of banking facilities among weavers community now this is because the weaving community cannot provide any collateral and because of this banks are not willing to provide them loan at substantial rate of interest and according to the handloom census 76% of the weavers do not have access to banks and this forces the weaving community to take credit from outside the banking channels where the rate of interest is very high another set of challenge is conventional product range now this is also because of lack of awareness about the markets and various products available in the markets lack of awareness among weavers particularly regarding finance and sales of their products now another set of concern is weak marketing link so this in a way restricts the promotion of their product and because of weak marketing link the product is mostly being sold in the local market and this deprive the weavers of proper revenue or proper profit so the handloom census highlights that 64% of sales happens in the local market another set of concern is overall stagnation of production and sales meager income of the weavers as 67% of the weavers earn less than 5000 per month and because of this low income the next generation is very reluctant or not willing to take up the weaving skill and because of low wages and low earnings the next generation of the weaver class is looking for other alternatives of employment so it highlights that younger generations are not willing to take up weaving work due to meager income and lack of financial support further low income has led to decline in number of weavers from 43.3 lakhs in 2009-10 to 35.22 lakhs in 2019-20 which we have seen earlier as well now another set of concern is regarding purchase of yarns for weaving purposes now mostly the weavers purchase these yarns from the open market which is rather expensive and because of these expensive yarns it eats up in their profit margin 
so it says that most weavers purchase yarn from open market rather than from government or cooperative societies and price fluctuations in the open market ends up eating up their profit margin so ultimately it results in meager income for the weaving community and another set of concern is lack of options to buy authentic handloom products through e-commerce or through online shopping so to address this multiple concerns and challenges of the handloom sector the government of india has come up with various schemes to provide financial support to the industry and the weavers provide market links so that the weaving community can sell their product and earn a substantial profit provide education to the children of weavers community and also provide proper price for the raw materials which is used in the handloom sector so on this note let's go through these government schemes for the development of handloom sector and welfare of handloom weavers and these schemes can be categorized as national handloom development program comprehensive handloom cluster development scheme handloom weavers comprehensive welfare scheme and yarn supply scheme now the national handloom development scheme comprises of various components and all these different schemes overall provides financial assistance to the handloom sector or to the handloom industry so under the national handloom development program it comprises various sub components these sub components are number 1 block level cluster under which financial assistance up to rupees 2 crores per block level cluster is provided for various interventions now these interventions are in the manner of skill upgradation hath kardha samvardhan sahayata under which it provide looms or accessories to the weavers to enhance their earnings through improved productivity and quality of handloom products and under the hss scheme 90% of the cost of loom or accessory is borne by the government of india while 10% is borne by the beneficiary so this becomes an important highlight from your prelims perspective the government of india share is released to the supplier through weaver service center so coming back to the block level cluster financial assistance is provided through skill upgradation hath kardha samvardhan sahayata product development construction of workshed project management cost design development setting up of common facility center etc now apart from this a financial assistance of up to rupees 50 lakhs can also be provided for setting up of one die house at district level and these proposals are recommended by the respective state governments now the third sub component of national handloom development program is handloom marketing assistance whereby financial assistance is provided to states or eligible handloom agencies so that a market can be organized from where the weavers can sell directly to the consumers so it says that in order to provide marketing platform to the handloom agencies or weavers to sell their products directly to consumers financial assistance is provided to the states or eligible handloom agencies and they organize these marketing events both in india and also outside india whereby the weavers and the artisans can sell their product directly to the consumers the next component is weaver mudra scheme where credit or capital is provided at a concessional rate of 6% to the handloom weavers now under the weaver mudra scheme margin money assistance is also provided to weavers to a maximum of rupees 10000 per weaver and credit guarantee for a period of 3 years is also provided further to cut down the disbursal cost that is time taken to disburse the money under the scheme mudra portal has been developed in association with punjab national bank to cut down delay in disbursement of funds for margin money and interest subvention now other component includes education of children of handloom weavers and for this purpose ministry of textiles has signed mous with ignu that is indira gandhi national open university and national institute of open schooling or nios and through these mous educational facilities are provided to children of weavers and their families so here nios offers secondary and senior secondary level education having specialized subjects on design marketing business development etc through distance learning mode for handloom weavers and ignu also promotes education of children of the weaving community 
It further says that the program envisages reimbursement of 75% of the fee towards admission to NIOS or IGNU courses in case of scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, below poverty line and women learners belonging to handloom weavers families. So the government of India also caters to the education of children of the weaving community or handloom weavers. Now another subcomponent of national handloom development program is India Handloom Brand. Now this has been launched for branding of high quality handloom products and this promotes production of niche handloom products having high quality authentic traditional designs with zero defect and zero effect on environment. So the India Handloom Brand basically promotes niche product developed by the handloom industry. Now another subcomponent is the e-commerce part. So in order to promote e-marketing of handloom products, a policy framework has been designed where e-commerce platforms can sell the handloom products or can participate in online marketing of handloom products. And the last subcomponent is the urban hearts. Now this also provides direct marketing facilities to the craft or weavers and eliminate the middle persons. So these urban hearts are set up in big towns or metropolitan cities and here also the idea is that the weavers directly sell to the consumers without any middle persons. So here it says that 39 such urban hearts have been sanctioned across India so far. So these are some of the important subcomponents of the National Handloom Development Program. Now coming to the other schemes for handloom sector is the Comprehensive Handloom Cluster Development Scheme. Now this is targeted to develop mega handloom clusters in clearly identifiable geographical locations which covers at least 15,000 handlooms. So under this scheme the government provides financial support and under this scheme the government of India contributes up to rupees 40 crore per cluster over a period of 5 years. So this is regarding the comprehensive handloom cluster development scheme. Now under this scheme, there are certain components for which the government of India provides full funding, that is 100%. So it says that components such as conducting diagnostic study, corpus for raw material, etc. are fully funded by the government. Whereas there are certain components under the scheme for which government of India provides 90% funding, such as lightning units, technological upgradation of looms and accessories. And there are other aspects or other components for which the government of India provides 80% of the funding. These includes creation of infrastructure for design studio or marketing complex, governmenting unit, marketing development, assistance for exports and also publicity. So the government of India provides financial support especially to the mega handloom clusters under the comprehensive handloom cluster development scheme. Now coming to the other two scheme namely the handloom weavers comprehensive welfare scheme. So this is a scheme aimed at socio-economic welfare and hence provides life and accidental and disability insurance coverage under the components of Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana, Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bhima Yojana and Converged Mahatma Gandhi Bunkar Bhima Yojana. Now the next scheme is the Yarn Supply Scheme and it is implemented throughout the country to make available all types of yarn at mill gate price so that raw materials can be procured at affordable prices. So these are the four important schemes with respect to the handloom industries, namely the National Handloom Development Program, Comprehensive Handloom Cluster Development Scheme, Handloom Weavers Comprehensive Welfare Scheme and Yarn Supply Scheme. Now, apart from the schemes, the Government of India has also taken some of the recent steps to facilitate the growth of handloom workers. So the states and union territories have been requested that the state handloom corporations or cooperatives or agencies to purchase from finished inventory which is available with the handloom weavers. Further, the weavers have also been asked to sell their products on the government e-market portal and the portal will allow the sellers or the weavers to sell directly to various government agencies or ministries or their departments. So it says that steps have been taken to onboard weavers on government e-marketplace to enable them to sell their products directly to various government departments organizations. Further, under the concessional credit or weaver mudra scheme, financial assistance is also provided. So the financial assistance provided is regarding margin money assistance. Now margin money can be understood as the following. Suppose we take a loan and the bank provides us 80% of the loan, yet we have to pay 20% from our own pocket. 
so it is possible for the weaving community that they are not able to provide or procure this 20 percent which they have to pay from their pocket and for this purpose the government provides margin money assistance scheme so it says that margin money assistance at 20 percent of loan amount can be provided subject to a maximum of rupees 25,000 per weaver and margin money assistance at a rate 20% of loan amount can be provided subject to maximum of rupees 20 lakh rupees 2 lakh for every 100 weaver or workers per handloom organizations so it provides margin money assistance to individual weavers and also to group of weavers working in an organizations now the next component is interest subvention up to 7% for 3 years now let's understand this through an example. Suppose the interest provided by the bank is 10%. So interest subvention up to 7% means that the weaver has to only pay interest of 3% for 3 years and the rest 7% of the interest will be paid by the government. So this is the meaning of interest subvention scheme up to 7% for 3 years. Now the third point is credit guarantee on loans for 3 years. Now credit guarantee means suppose if a weaver has taken a loan and the weaver defaults that is he is not able to or he is unable to repay the interest then in such situation the government repays the interest for 3 years. So this is the meaning of credit guarantee on loans. So these are some of the financial concessions provided to weavers under the mudra scheme. Now it further says that there is no scheme for providing free electricity to the handloom weavers. However, solar lightning units as part of Hath Kargha Samvardhan Sahayata items are being provided under the National Handloom Development Program. So these are some of the recent steps which has been taken by the government of India for the handloom sectors or for the growth of handloom workers in India. So despite these financial assistance through different government schemes, the Indian handloom sector or Indian handloom industry still faces certain challenges. Thus this topic becomes very important particularly from the section of Indian economy under GS paper 3 for the handloom sector. Now let's take up this news appearing on page number 9 regarding freebies. And this article mentions about the case of Andhra Pradesh. Now Supreme Court recently has observed or rather provided a strict observation on the use of freebies as according to the supreme court freebies does not only create financial burden for the state but also disturbs the level playing field with respect to indian elections however the state of andhra pradesh has filed a petition whereby it has stated that their freebies that is freebies with respect to their schemes are an example of social investment and should not be seen as a financial burden so overall this has been the debate with respect to freebies that is are they social investment in the name of state affirmatives which is supported by the directive principles of state policy under part 4 of the Indian constitution and on the other hand how much state affirmative actions are justified in the name of fiscal prudence or in other words can state continue to provide these freebies without looking into the financial burden these freebies are creating. And based on this RBI in its report has red flagged 10 states because they have taken substantial amount of debt to provide these freebies. So the RBI in its report highlights that different states raises these loans from multiple sources and these multiple loans from different sources increases the debt burden on the state. Now it increases the debt burden on the state also because of declining revenue in the recent times especially after covid pandemic. And based on these increased debt burden of states, RBI in its report has red flagged 10 states that is it has identified 10 states whose debt burden as compared to their state GDP has increased substantially. So this newspaper highlights that Andhra Pradesh along with Punjab are the two states having highest debt burden which is also reflected in their debt to GSDP ratio. GSDP stands for Gross State Domestic Product and it also reflects or showcases states ability to pay back its debt based on their earnings or based on their GDP growth. Now regarding the debt to GSDP ratio, higher the ratio more time it will take for the state to repay the debts 
Hence, higher debt GSDP ratio is not a fiscal prudent measure. And a higher debt to GSDP ratio also reflects higher risk of default for that particular state. Now let's understand this through a simple example. Suppose there are two states A and B. The GDP or the production in state A is 10% whereas GDP of state B is 5%. So it is more likely for state A to repay back its debt as compared to state B because its earnings are less or its productions are less because its GSDP or GDP in the state is less as compared to state A. So state A has more fiscal space to take up any kind of loan as it can repay back its loan because of its higher earning or because of its higher level of production in its state as compared to state B. Now it is here where the RBI data becomes important as it highlights expenditure on freebies which ranges from 0.1% of GSDP that is gross state domestic product to 2.7% of GSDP. And for some of the states, the debts taken or the loans taken from multiple sources becomes no longer sustainable. That is, the state will no longer be able to repay back the debt or the interest. So according to the RBI data, growth of debt in the last five years has increased as compared to growth of GDP. Now this simply means that growth of a state has not increased in the same proportion as compared to the increasing debt taken by that state. So in other words, it also means that the state does not have the capacity to repay back the interest or to repay back the loan. Or in other words, the ability of the state to repay back the increasing debt becomes less. Now another important observation of RBI is that expenditure by states on freebies is larger than total interest payment on the debts. Now this overall showcases poor financial health and it also reflects that some of the states are closer to defaulting on their interest payment which means that some of the states will no longer be able to pay back the debt or pay back the interest because their growth has declined substantially. Another major observation of RBI is that majority of the states have breached the 3% target under the respective fiscal responsibility legislations. So this basically means that states are increasing their debt liability or increasing their loans without having the revenue or without having the ability to pay back the debt. And this is also a worrisome factor because of the stagnated industrial growth in the last few years, especially after COVID. And this overall has resulted in decline in revenue for the state government. And this is also reflected through low state GST collections or lower state goods and services tax collections. So in order to sustain the debt, the state needs to increase their revenue. Now borrowing by the states despite decline in the revenue will have a long term consequences. So the point highlighted here is that higher rate of borrowing by the present generation or the present government means that higher tax burden will fall on the future generation or the future government. The second point highlighted is long term borrowing cannot be sustained in the short term by respective state governments especially if they keep on borrowing to dole out freebies. And it will also result in more misses on the FRBM Act as the borrowings by the state government will definitely exceed the limitations put up by the FRBM Act. The third point highlighted is that impact on the infrastructure development would jeopardize the long-term sustainable growth of such states. Now this is because most of the debt is being utilized to dole out freebies and this will not leave much amount to be invested for infrastructural development purposes. The next point highlighted is that consistent reliance on freebies would impact the employability aptitude among the poor class and this will further impact productivity among these states. The next point is that freebies also goes against the free play of market forces thereby impacting the competitiveness among the private players. The next concern is that freebies also increases the skewed demand of only some products such as color TV or bicycles which is announced to be distributed among the voters. 
and because of this black marketing can also be promoted in that particular product the next concern is that it also promotes collusive corruption in the long run especially with the private sector as the government can favor a particular producer or a private player to procure certain products even at higher prices and lastly freebies goes against the genuine confidence among the consumers in the market as when people wait for the freebies and restrict their immediate consumption all the sellers do not get business all around the year so it also overall impact the economy or the market so these can be said to be some of the long term consequences with respect to doling out freebies by respective state governments as highlighted by RBI in its report so this article basically deals with the economic impact of doling out freebies by respective state governments especially in the circumstances when their revenue is declining and their debt is continuously rising and hence this topic becomes very important under gs paper 2 with respect to polity and governance now based on our discussion this becomes your practice question for mains the question is provision for freebies is do supported by states affirmative action yet it has to be fiscally prudent discuss and this question needs to be answered within 150 words and carries 10 marks the next news for discussion appears on page number 12 and this news mentions about the approval for field trial of genetically modified mustard so it says that gac which is genetic engineering appraisal committee functioning under ministry of environment forest and climate change has given its nod for commercial cultivation of gm mustard so the gac at its meeting has permitted the environmental release of two varieties of genetically engineered mustard so that it can be used for developing new parental lines and hybrids under the administration of icar which is the indian council of agricultural research now gac has recommended the environmental release of transgenic mustard hybrid dmh11 which is developed by the center for genetic manipulation of crop plants at delhi university and gm hybrid is a product of crossing two plants containing barnes and barstar genes derived from soil bacteria now the gac has also recommended conducting field demonstration studies with respect to effect of gm mustard on honey bees and also other pollinators as a precautionary mechanism and also to find out its after effects or any adverse effects so whenever we talk about consumption of a genetically modified crop there are set of people who supports the argument given the growing food insecurity in the world and there are a set of people who are against this idea of consuming gm crops surely because of lack of knowledge of its adverse effects so as a part of our discussion we shall go through both highlights that is reasons for supporting the field trial of genetically modified crops and also reasons against such field trial now based on this understanding this becomes your practice question for your mains examination the question is despite successful efforts at field trials of genetically modified edible crops there have been protest against their consumption examine the use and consumption of genetically modified crops based on existing examples and because of the unknown adverse impact of consuming these gm crops or consuming the genetically modified crops gac has also provided for certain conditions for its commercial clearance so it says that approval is for a limited period of 4 years and is renewable for 2 years at a time as per compliance report external experts will also visit the growing sites of the crop at least once during each season applicant shall deposit 100 grams of each of approved hybrids as well as their parental lines with icar national bureau of plant genetic resources and also communicate the same to gac within 30 days of issue of this clearance letter for the purpose of future reference in case of trade traceability and dispute on account of ownership and the applicant should also formulate and fix dna fingerprints of the approved varieties to the icar for further research so these are some of the conditions which has been put forward by gac with respect to approval of use of genetically modified mustard now let's go through some of the major functions of gac or genetic engineering appraisal committee which has been accorded according to the 1989 rules which is basically the manufacture use import export and storage of hazardous microorganism genetically engineered organism or cell rules 1989 so the functions of gac include 
to appraise activities involving large scale use of hazardous microorganisms and the recombinants in the research and industrial production from the environmental angle to appraise proposals relating to release of genetically engineered organisms and products into environment including experimental field trials so it is gac which approve the field trials and committee or any persons authorized by the committee it has powers to take punitive action under environment protection act so the geac also has power to take punitive action that is it can impose liabilities under the environment protection act of 1986 so these are some of the major functions of geac as per the 1989 rules so there are a lot of debates and discussion whenever we hear about genetically modified crops especially an edible crop so on this note let's go through some of the merits of consuming gm crops or having gm crops and also issues associated with gm crops so the merits of having gm crops is obviously ensuring food security so the genetically modified crops not only ensures greater yield or greater production but it also reduces the pest in the plants thereby increasing the farmers income so the next point automatically becomes better income levels of the farmers as higher productivity give farmers better chances to realize greater incomes and and economic gains the next point is integration with other farm practices so it says that gm crops eliminate the necessity of pre emergence spraying zero tilling or minimum tilling that can be integrated with these crops and in a way it also saves lot of efforts of the farmers next important point is soil and biodiversity conservation as use of gm crops can lead to reduce soil erosion and conservation of soil microfauna and flora and various studies have also revealed that use of biotech crops in the last two decades has reduced environmental footprints from agriculture by reducing the greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide methane and nitrous oxides the next point is crop protection as through the use of gm crops it ensures weed control and the pest attacks here it highlights that use of genetically engineered insect resistant crops has also reduced the use of chemicals insecticides and it also helps in fighting climate change by developing drought resistant crops for example drought tolerant maize was released in 2013 so these can be said to be some of the benefits of having gm crops in our food basket however there are certain concerns as well the first major concern is gene flow which may impact the flora fauna and also the biodiversity of the world so it says that the transgene can be transferred from the gm crops to sexually compatible species and can impact environment by production of hybrids so production of hybrids may affect the species at large now another set of concern is non target effects for example effect of bt toxin on monarch butterfly larvae so some monarch butterfly larvae were fed with transgenic bt corn pollen and for such monarch butterfly larvae it became disastrous as they ate less grew more slowly and suffered higher mortality so it can be said to be potentially hazardous for such monarch butterflies who consume transgenic bt corn pollen another set of concern is effect on biodiversity as herbicide resistant gm crops may lead to reduction in number of weed species thereby reducing the weed diversity in gm and neighboring fields now this may also affect the overall biodiversity in the region and it can also affect the soil ecosystem so it says that bt toxin enter soil through the residues incorporated after crop is harvested now 25 fields in the vardha region of india were selected to study the effect of bt cotton and in these fields 8 to 9% decline in carbon biomass and nitrogen biomass was recorded so overall it's not a good sign for the soil ecosystem as it also affects the nitrogen fixing bacteria and the next concern is formation of super weeds so it says that continuous cultivation of gm crops may lead to creation of super weeds because the weeds may evolve and may develop resistance to herbicide thereby creating trouble to the farmers so overall these can be said to be some of the concerns or issues associated with the use of gm crops hence more field trial and more surveys are necessary before the government allows consumption of edible gm food crops 
Thus, this topic becomes important both from the prelims and mains perspective and gets covered under GS Paper 3, especially with respect to the use of biotechnology. The next news to be taken up appears on page number 14. And this news highlights that ISRO to boost NAVIC. Now, NAVIC stands for Navigation with Indian Constellation. And it is just like the United States GPS or Global Positioning System. So, ISRO to boost NAVIC, widen user base of location system. Now, as of now, NAVIC can be used only within India and within a range of 1500 kilometers. But slowly, ISRO wants to make the use of NAVIC more global. However, to make NAVIC more global, more satellites have to be added in the NAVIC constellation. So, based on this idea of global usage of NAVIC, the government has asked the smartphone manufacturers to make the smartphones NAVIC compatible. And presently, Qualcomm and Mindtech have agreed to incorporate the features of NAVIC within the smartphone, for which certain hardware changes are to be made. So once our smartphones become compatible with NAVIC, then we can use NAVIC just like we use GPS in the present circumstances. So talking about NAVIC, it is India's indigenous navigation satellite system and established by ISRO and has been functional since April 2018. Now presently, NAVIC consists of space segment and ground segment. The space segment has the constellation of seven IRNSSS satellites, that is Indian Regional Navigation Satellites, which are spread across India. And the system is providing positioning, navigation and also timing service. And one satellite, RNSS-1A, is providing messaging service. So our very own indigenous NAVIC can help in navigation on land, air and also sea and it can also prove useful in disaster management. Further, it can be used by fishermen so that they know that they do not cross the Indian waters. It further highlights that NAVIC satellites are placed at a higher orbit as compared to the GPS of United States. Now, GPS satellites are placed in medium Earth orbit with an altitude of about 20,000 kilometers, whereas NAVIC satellites are placed in geostationary orbit and geosynchronous orbit with an altitude of approximately 36,000 kilometers. Further, NAVIC uses dual frequency bands and this allows the receivers to correct certain atmospheric errors through simultaneous use of two frequencies. And it also helps in better reliability and availability because the signal from either frequency can serve the positioning requirements equally well. So these are some of the important highlights with respect to India's NAVIC, which is Navigation with Indian Constellation. Now the government had a meeting with industry experts so that our smartphones can become NAVIC compatible. However, the industry experts have said that it is difficult to achieve the deadline of January 2023. And it is because of the different bands which is used by NAVIC. So from an examination perspective, what we need to know is that presently NAVIC is supported by L5 bands, whereas the industry is pitching for support of L1 band to incorporate NAVIC in mobile handsets. And according to ISRO, it plans to launch satellites with L1 band only by 2425. So according to smartphone mobile manufacturers, unless L1 band is incorporated in the NAVIC system, it will be difficult to incorporate the features of NAVIC in mobile handset. And if NAVIC features are incorporated in the mobile handsets in the present time, then it will inflate the cost or it will increase the cost. Because presently NAVIC uses a different band which is referred as the L5 band, whereas the industry experts are pitching for or favoring the L1 band. Further, the industry experts are also saying that NAVIC support in mobile phone is possible in 5G chipsets and not in 4G chipsets. And it is again because of use of different bands as NAVIC is presently supported by L5 bands. And ISRO only plans to launch satellites with L1 band by the year 2024-25. So it's quite likely that it might take some time for our smartphones to become compatible with NAVIC. Now, presently, NAVIC can be used only within our own territory. However, ISRO wants to make NAVIC more global in its approach, which means that tomorrow, suppose if you go to Europe or you go to Australia or the United States, then even there you can use NAVIC. But for that purpose, 
ISRO has to increase the satellites with respect to the NAVIC constellation. For example, presently, GPS uses approx 30 or 31 satellites. So NAVIC, in order to have a global coverage, need to increase its number of satellites, probably to 31 or say to 35. And only then NAVIC can be used across the globe. So in this topic, you need to know about certain specificities regarding India's NAVIC, which is the navigation with Indian constellation and its comparison with GPS. And this topic becomes important both from your prelims and mains perspective. And in the mains gets covered under GS paper 3, particularly with respect to indigenization of technology and developing new technology.